I'm very happy to be with you, brethren. Amen. Unfortunately, I was I had to work this week and I missed a lot of the meetings, but <clears throat> I know you spoke of some good things. You heard some good things. And I want to, in uh, this text, Philippians chapter 1, verses 27, I want to include verse 28 also. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. <clears throat> I'd like to have a word of prayer also. Father, we pray that you would bless both the speaking and the hearing of the message of the gospel this evening. We thank you for it. We pray that uh, it would come with power and that it would be heard and taken heed to. We pray, Lord, above all, that your name would be magnified in our midst this evening. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I am all in favor of expository preaching. But this text, uh, to me, seemed like a, a good text to just be a, an exhortation. And that's not to say I'm not going to uh, talk about what it means or anything like that, but, but this is mainly a, a text of exhortation because if you're, if you're in Christ and you read this, it's really, you don't need a whole lot of explanation about what it's talking about. That you only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Now that can be very profound, but in another sense, there's nothing too complicated about that. If the Spirit dwells in you, you know what that means. I don't need to get up here and, and define that for you. As I said, I am going to speak about it, though. <clears throat> the gospel of Christ is a declaration. It's a declaration about what God is doing through Jesus Christ. And it comes with power to all who believe it. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power, <clears throat> and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance. So really, the gospel of Christ is, is really all we have to say. And no matter what the audience is, that's what we have to say, and it's more than adequate. The gospel of God is revealed, and his glory shines through it. The, glory, the gospel glorifies and magnifies Jesus Christ, who is the Lord's Christ, and the Lamb of God, and the King of kings, and the Lord of lords. The gospel is the message about what God is doing through Jesus Christ, and what he is doing is saving and blessing believing people. So since it originates in God, and it's fulfilled in Christ, and of course the Holy Spirit is working through it, the gospel is such that only worthiness must be associated with it. All persons and all things associated with the gospel must be sanctified to God. <clears throat> they must be becoming of the gospel, that is, they must be fit. They must be suitable. They must be ornamental to the gospel. Some other Bible versions say worthy. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. And only let your behavior do credit to the good news of Christ. Above all else, you must live in a way that brings honor to the good news about Christ. Only conduct yourselves worthily of the glad tidings of the Christ. And live as citizens who reflect the good news about Christ. Amen. Those are all very good. <clears throat> Perhaps not necessarily complete, but very good. The idea is that we must live in a way that shows that the gospel is the truth. It's not just talk. And when the gospel is seen to be the truth, then God and his Christ are glorified. And we are exhorted to do this because we are being watched and we are being listened to. Not only by the people in this world, but by persons in heaven. Creatures and elders and angels and the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit themselves. Furthermore, <clears throat> worthiness is a necessity because the gospel comes to us at great expense. It is the very core of the message is a message of, of a price paid, of tremendous, unfathomable expense. 
The gospel is about Jesus who gave himself for us, washed us in his blood according to the gracious will of God the Father, made atonement for all our sins, rose from the dead according to the scriptures and ascended to the right hand of the Father to rule over his enemies. And not only these facts, but all the ramifications of these are proclaimed in the gospel. The apostles wrote about it and preached it throughout the world. Saints of every generation have believed it and preached and died for it. The gospel goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. God began preaching the gospel as soon as he had two people to hear it. And it never faded away. That was the thread, that is the thread through the whole scripture is the gospel, what God is going to do through Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and here we are, several thousand years later, they were looking forward to it, we're proclaiming it, that it's done. Christ has come and accomplished it. <clears throat> so now if you want to claim association with faithful people, like Enoch, and like Noah, and Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph, and Moses, and Aaron, and Joshua, and Caleb, and Samuel, and David, and Isaiah, and Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, and all the prophets, these who, who looked for what you now possess. If you want to claim association with them, and with by faith with the whole family of God, in heaven and earth, along with Peter, and James, and John, and the Apostle Paul, and if you profess to believe in Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, then I exhort you to only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Another good Bible word here is adorn. The Holy Spirit speaks about adorning in the epistle to Titus. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again, <clears throat> not purloining, but showing all good fidelity, faithfulness, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Now adorn doesn't mean to make it look more attractive because it is already very attractive. You can't make the gospel sound better than it really is. If there is any difficulty with the proclamation of the gospel, the difficulty is with us, not in the message itself, not in the truth of it. The message is so wonderful that we can scarcely proclaim it, at least not to our satisfaction. Adorn means to live so that people can see that it is attractive and true. Season your speech with salt. Shine the light of Christ in every situation. Make sure others see and hear Jesus through you and show him to be beautiful to them. Adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Show that the message is real and that it's true. When Paul confronted Peter for removing himself from the Gentiles at the table <clears throat> and caused some other Jews to do the same and Barnabas, he said, when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, the fears of Peter and the others contradicted the message of the gospel. There was no commandment, thou shalt sit with Gentiles when you eat, yet what they did contradicted the message of the gospel with the spirit of it. There is no longer Jew or Gentile in Christ Jesus, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. But Christ is all and in all. So Peter didn't break a rule, he contradicted the message. Having your conversation as it becomes the gospel of Christ covers every aspect of your life, even when you get up from the table to go sit by someone else. Our very word and every action, even our thoughts, are making declarations. Let our conversation, our walk, our conduct be as that that becomes the gospel of Christ. <clears throat> the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are involved in this. <clears throat> Brother Given wrote in the, uh, the handout with the list of topics for this year's renewal, he wrote in that, that the objective of the gospel has been established by God, the center of the gospel is Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit is the one who interfaces humanity with the gospel. So the, God, the Godhead <clears throat> is preeminent in the gospel, not man. 
It's a message that's preached to men, and it's for men, but it's not preeminently about men. It's about the Godhead, particularly about Christ. So if we are to understand what it means to have our conversation as it becomes the gospel, then we must have God preeminent in us. Anyone who has their conversation becoming of the gospel of Christ is living in harmony with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> now why, I want to look at for a few moments why this is necessary, why the Holy Spirit exhorted us to do these things. <clears throat> well, a short answer is so that God may be glorified. God is going to be glorified in his people as he has been glorified in his Son. So the, the question is, are you going to be one of them? God is going to be glorified. The word becometh or becoming implies that we are being watched. If no one could ever see you, it wouldn't matter if you were becoming or not. So becoming has to do with someone's watching you. <clears throat> the saints are the light of the world and a city set on a hill that cannot be hid. We're watched both in heaven and in earth. Paul said we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. This is true, for we are unto God, a sweet savor of Christ, in them that are saved and in them that are perish. To the one we are a savor of death unto death, and to the other the savor of life unto life. Others are watching, looking for light and for salt. Some people don't know that's what they're looking for, but they are. If the world should seek to ask you why you live the way you do, don't live so that they ask you how you got to be so wealthy or how you got to be so fit and trim or where you got your sense of humor. Let us live so that they ask about the sacrifices that we make. Let them ask about our dying with Christ. Oh, they may not word it that way. Let them ask about the peace that passes understanding. Let them mark that we are drastically different than what we used to be. Let them inquire about our steadfastness and our faithfulness and our reliability and our endurance and unwavering devotion. Let's live so that the worldly people are uncomfortable when we are around. Uncomfortable. Not because we're obnoxious or irritating, but because they are confronted with God through us. There's a lot of good news to be declared in the gospel, but at the center of it, is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Whenever you think about the gospel, that your thoughts must be drawn to that. That is at the very heart and core of it, is Christ putting away sins, his sacrifice, his sufferings, his approval of the Father, his resurrection from the dead, and his present reign at the Father's right hand. <clears throat> no one can have their conversation as it becomes the gospel and get away from this truth that the life of faith is lived out in the death and the burial and resurrection of Jesus. It's lived out in us. At the core of the adorning doctrine, at the core of adorning the doctrine is the denial of self and the world and the crucifixion of the old man and walking in the spirit. Like Jesus did, we lose our lives in this world so that we may gain it in the world to come. In this second verse, Philippians 1.28, in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. When the world sees Christ in us, it could be that some will be attracted to what they see. Nevertheless, the world will hate you. The world already does hate you. <clears throat> but people who are living as it becomes the gospel of Christ are not terrified of our enemies in anything. That's because we know how this is all going to turn out. We can say to our enemies, do with me what you will, I will see you again. This isn't over yet. We are not to be terrified of our adversaries in anything. Now to this, this to them, your, your not being terrified is to them a token of perdition or their condemnation. That's their token of it. That this, this person's not afraid of the worst I can do. They've got to think about that. And the fact that you have the peace of Christ and you're not terrified is your token of salvation. 
It's a great error to try to fit into the world with the false premise of winning them to Christ. Something I've noted frequently, uh, particularly if you, if you work with other people that profess to be believers, if you, if you think the world hates you because you're a Christian, wait till they find out you're a hypocrite and see how they hate you. The world really does expect Christians to live like Christians. They really do. Not that we're trying to please the world, but I'm saying if a person's motivated by what other people think, they, they'll think a lot more highly of you if you're actually faithful to the Lord. <clears throat> so it, it, that's, that whole way of thinking is just wrong anyway, to be concerned with what the world thinks of us. <clears throat> Let them see the living and the dying of Christ in us. Also, we've received this exhortation to have our conversation as it becomes the gospel because heaven is watching to see who is like Christ. Those who live like Christ in this world are very highly regarded in heaven. Our Lord Jesus received the help of angels and the witness of the Holy Spirit and the confirmation and approval of the Father while he walked in this world. And if we walk as he walked, we can expect the same grace and mercies to follow us. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God has already buried us with Christ, and raised us with Christ, and seated us with Christ in heavenly places, when, godly, when God sees his people living as it becomes the gospel of Christ, this is of great value to him, and he will sustain us by his grace. In the book of the Revelation, Jesus is called the Lamb 28 times. That's because heaven will never get over the truth that the Lamb was slain and died for the sins of the world. Ever since Jesus ascended up into heaven, the mark of a worthy man is the mark of suffering in this world. The Father and the Holy Spirit and all the holy angels are not impressed with the wealthy or the powerful or the wise of this world, but they are impressed with people who are living like Christ, living as it becomes the gospel of Christ. They see the ones who sacrifice self, who have fervent charity for the brethren, who put off the things of this world and who seek after glory and immortality in the world to come. Amen. Moses was such a man. Now you may wonder how Moses could have his conversation as it becomes the gospel when he lived and died several thousand years before Christ came, but, but this is true, he did. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Moses had all the good of the land of Egypt in his hand, at his disposal. He was raised in the house of Pharaoh's daughter. He had an Egyptian education, the best education. He spoke the Egyptian language, Egyptian clothes, Egyptian food. He had all the privileges of Egyptian royalty, which include power and wealth and esteem of other men a promising future in the government of the land. But Moses knew he was not an Egyptian. He knew about the promises of God to Father Abraham, and he desired that more. He would rather suffer with the slaves than inherit all the riches of Egypt and the house of Pharaoh. So this is credited to him as the reproach of Christ. Moses would rather leave Egypt and come back 40 years later as a shepherd than to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. It was a reproach that led to the reward of the inheritance, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of reward. When you endure the hatred of the world because you have chosen what God has promised over everything else, and it will be a costly choice, then you know the reproach of Christ the same as Moses did. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. There in, 
there's the Moses fulfilling the second verse in our text. <clears throat> he was not terrified of, of the adversary. He didn't fear the wrath of the king. For another example, we take the Apostle Paul. <clears throat> we think about scriptural examples of people who lived becoming of the gospel. The Apostle Paul should be one of the prominent uh, persons in the scripture that come to mind <clears throat> because he wrote a large portion of the New Testament scriptures, so we know a lot more about Paul than some of the other apostles, perhaps. After his conversion, he spent his life for the cause of Christ and to preach the gospel. In 2 Corinthians 6, verse 4, he says, But in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown, yet well known, as dying, and behold, we live as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing all things. And again he writes in 2 Corinthians 11, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in labors, more abundant, in stripes, above measure, in prisons, more frequent, in deaths oft of the jews five times received i forty stripes save one thrice was i beaten with rods once was i stoned thrice i, I suffered shipwreck a night and a day i have been in the deep in journeyings often in perils of waters in perils of robbers in perils by my own countrymen in perils by the heathen in perils in the city in perils in the wilderness in perils in the sea in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides those things that are without that which cometh on me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is offended and I burn not? If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which confirm concern my infirmities. All of this came on Paul because of his devotion to the gospel. That's the only reason this came upon him. He continually preached the gospel of Christ. Only God knows the details of other things that this brother suffered that he didn't tell us about, but he didn't quit. He didn't cease or slow his service to Christ, and he did not complain. His conversation is one that becomes the gospel of Christ. You can see it lived out in this brother, in the record of this brother. <clears throat> I want to commend to you also the Apostle Paul at the time of his death. When any of us confronts death, there's going to be a temptation to be afraid to let go of the things of this world. I don't, I don't know how this is avoidable, <clears throat> whether it's family or friends or important responsibilities that we have ministries that we are involved in, legitimate things, projects and good works for God that we want to finish, cares and concerns for other people. But consider, brethren, I want you to think about this, that the people of God do not suffer loss when they pass from this world. There is an illusion that when we're here, we're in control. I, I think particularly of our children. I've got little children. There's an illusion here that we we can help them and we're in control here like but if I were to pass away I'd, I'd worry about my children see that's actually that's backwards thinking because when I pass away I'm going to the place where all the power is power here is really an illusion whatever whatever we have was given to us by God there's where the power is there's where the Saints are going I can't help but think of the Apostle Paul in this way too how that uh, when he when he passed on he didn't suffer any loss. There's no loss to the people of God 
who pass from this world. Paul said to die is gain. And who had more responsibility and a greater ministry than Paul, other than Christ himself, who had more investment in the churches than Paul? And when Paul saw the end of his life was in sight, he wrote to Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, 7, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course, not the course. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Now, did Paul mean I have preached everywhere I wanted to preach? I've been to all the countries I wanted to go to. I've visited all the churches I wanted to visit. I've written all the epistles I wanted to, and I'm done now. I don't have any more concern about the churches. Everything's set. Do you really think that's what he meant by this? I, I, can't see, I can't see the Apostle Paul saying something like that. We know he wanted to go to Spain. He said, right, well, I'll, I'll come see you when I come around Spain. He never made it to Spain. He passed from this world before he made it to Spain and probably a lot of other places he wanted to go. But he said, I fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. So it didn't mean there wasn't anything left for him to do. It meant not my will, but thine be done. Just like Jesus. Amen. Whatever, whatever my plans are, whatever I think I might need to do, whether I'm, I'm living or I'm about to die, it matters not. We should live as it become with the gospel of Christ. And I can't help but think that involves losing our lives in this world, falling on the stone. <clears throat> and he continues, 2 Timothy 4, 6, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Paul didn't say I'm ready to die. He said I'm ready to be offered. His life was an offering. You know, offerings, sacrifice has to have some value to it. You didn't just offer any kind of leftover junk to the Lord. There was, there was value to it. Paul had, Paul had made his life of value to God. It was an offering for the Apostle Paul to die. Amen. <clears throat> but Paul did not consider the value of his life and ministry a loss. He looked at it as an offering. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but to all them also that love his appearing. Even Paul's death was becoming of the gospel of Christ. So like our Lord, it was selfless and yielded to the will of God. So in closing, brethren, I want to exhort all of us, myself included, of course, don't be afraid of losing your life in this world. <clears throat> There's no loss in going to be with the Lord. There's no loss by losing your life in this world. You'll gain the world to come. Amen. But what things were gained to me, those I counted, for I counted loss for Christ, yea, doubtless, and I count, present tense, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, and the, that's Know him because you've experienced it like he experienced it. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. <clears throat> so, brethren, I exhort you, whether in living or in dying, only, only, like nothing else, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. <clears throat>